Today's passage is about uh, naming and being named. Uh, it is something sacred, I think, about a name. And we see it here today. Uh, we in this passage are being named by Jesus and we are naming Him. Uh, in many cultures, Christian and non-Christian, the naming of a child is a sacred act. In African tradition, the father is the first one to whisper a child's name into its ear. The first time the, ch the child hears his or her name. When a monk or nun enters a religious order, they are given a new name. I've known adults who have gone through a transformational experience in their life and have after that changed their name. Do you like your name? I know some who do and some who don't. For a variety of reasons. My parents accidentally reversed my first and middle names on my birth certificate, which I did not know until I was 16 and went for a driver's license. They were so excited and overwhelmed by twins being born, which they learned two days earlier, and the fact that we were six weeks early that they wrote on the birth certificate a different name than they intended. They meant to write Stephen Harold Shoemaker, but what they wrote was Harold Stephen Shoemaker. So thereafter, when my name was called in school, they'd said, is Harold here? And I would meekly, with some embarrassment, say, my name is Steve. I go by Steve. Um, isn't it interesting... Uh, if someone mis mispronounces your name, don't you feel kind of awkward? You feel like you're a, a child again. You kind of sh you shrink to f five years old. I know some people who love their names. They've researched what it means, and they have, and they uh, say, "This is who I am, and this is who I want to be." Do you think that? you might have a secret name that God has given to you? I like to think so. And then throughout our lives, we are seeking to discover our secret name, the name that unlocks the mystery of who we are at our deepest level. So let's look at the text today. It's all about naming and being named. John the Baptist was standing around with two of his disciples. He saw Jesus walking by and said aloud, Behold, the Lamb of God. What can this name mean? It comes from the deepest places in the Hebrew psyche and memory as a people. There was the sacrificial lamb. There was the sin-bearing lamb. There was the Passover lamb whose blood marked the doors of the Hebrew homes and saved them on the evening before they were set free from slavery. So, Jesus the lamb who bears our sins and bears them away. Jesus the lamb whose blood takes away the sin of the world. Jesus the lamb who passes us over from life to from death to life, from slavery to freedom. All these meanings and more are contained in this name. John's two disciples heard his words and decided to follow Jesus and see what he was about. When Jesus sees them, he asks, What do you seek? What are you looking for? They answer, Rabbi or teacher. That is the first name given to Jesus in this text today. Then they asked him, where are you staying? In John's gospel, all language is multi-layered. Where are you staying is not about where he's spending the night, but where he abides spiritually. It's not where he hangs his hat, it's where he hangs his soul. Earlier in John, we are told that Jesus has come from the breast of 
God. This is his primary abode. So Jesus does not say, I'm at the Holiday Inn, or I'm staying at Martha's house, or I'm down by the river tonight. He says elusively, compellingly, come and see. Where are you staying? Close to the heartbeat of God. Where is that? Come and see. One of the two is named Andrew, who happens to be the brother of Simon, who we have learned to call Peter. Simon goes to, Andrew goes to Simon and says, We have found the Messiah. First Jesus is called Rabbi, now he's called Messiah. Now, the word Messiah has been given all kinds of meanings through the centuries, some of which have nothing to do with Jesus. But literally, at its deepest level, it means anointed one. Jesus is the one who is anointed by God to carry out God's holy work in the world. The Greek word for Messiah is Christ. So Andrew takes his brother to see Jesus. Jesus looks at Simon and says, So you're Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas, or Peter. The name meant rock, which Peter would become for Jesus the rest of his life. Except, of course, for that one night when Jesus was arrested and he denied knowing Jesus, and the rock crumbled. We don't always live up to our names, do we? So we see going on a two-way naming. We are naming Jesus, and Jesus is giving us our true names, the name for our truest, deepest self. The scene now shifts back north to Galilee. There Jesus meets a person named Philip and says to him, follow me. This is the truest meaning of what it means to be a Christian. That is to be a follower of Jesus and his way. Now, what did Philip do first as he followed Jesus? He went to find his friend Nathaniel to tell him about him. This is how Philip described Jesus, named Jesus. It's like one of those Native American names, a, lo- a number of names strung together. This is how he named him. He is the one about whom Moses and the prophets wrote. In other words, the one we've been waiting for. Then he added, and he is Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Um, uh, Nathanael replies with incredulity, what good can come out of Nazareth? What good can come out of this hick town? We do that sometimes, don't we? We prejudge a person based on where they come from. So everybody fill in the blank, what good can come out of I bet you would each have a name. Sometimes towns have rivalries, don't they? Philip echoes Jesus' words to Nathaniel. He said to him, come and see. In other words, you will learn who he is as you follow him. Albert Schweitzer was the famous theologian, organist, box scholar, His famous book, The Quest of the Historical Jesus, sparked the the modern scholarly quest for the historical Jesus. But he discovered, as he studied, that the scholarly quest was insufficient to know who Jesus was. So here is the last luminous paragraph of his book. He comes to us as one unknown, without a name, as of old, by the lakeside. He came to those men who knew him not. He speaks to us the same word, follow thou me. 
and sets us to the tasks which he has to fulfill for our time. He commands, and to those who obey him, whether they be wise or simple, he will reveal himself in the toils, the sufferings, the conflicts which they shall pass through in his fellowship. And as an ineffable mystery, they shall learn in their own experience who he is. We know him as, as we follow him. Years later, Albert Schweitzer decided to follow Jesus to Africa, where he set up a, uh, a, a hospital in Lamborghini. He gave up his comfortable European professorship and went back to medical school. He wrote of this decision, I wanted to be a doctor that I might be able to work without having to talk. I felt like that as a preacher sometimes. <laughs> For years, he said, I had been giving myself out in words. Now he was putting his religion of love, as he termed it, into action. We learn who he is as we follow him. Tony Craven, the Old Testament professor at Bright Divinity School, speaks about God giving to Moses at the burning bush this strange name, elusive, untranslatable, unpronounceable, Yahweh, we say, but nobody knows for sure. It's a verb rather than a noun. Tony Craven says what God was saying to Moses was this, this is my name, and if you want to know what it means, follow me. Soon after, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him. He said, here is an Israelite in whom there is no guile, no deceit. Jesus was naming uh, Nathanael, I think, at this point, and his name for Nathanael was, what you see is what you get. Nathanael replied, how do you know me? Jesus said, in effect, I've been watching you. Then Nathanael comes forth with two new names for Jesus. Rabbi, he says, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. And Jesus responded, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So here are the last two names of Jesus in this passage. Jacob's Ladder and Gate of Heaven. Do you remember the story of Jacob? He had cheated his brother Esau out of birthright and blessing and had, che and had cheated his father and had deceived him. Now he was fleeing into the desert. That night as he slept under the stars, a dream was given him of a golden ladder stretching from heaven to earth with angels descending and ascending. God's voice came to him and said, I am Yahweh, God of Abraham and Isaac. I will fulfill my promise to you and your descendants to make you a blessing to all the earth. Behold, I will bless you wherever you go. Think about that. Instead of the blessing out he deserved, he got a blessing. Instead of condemnation, he got blessed assurance. When he awoke, he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. This is none other than the house of God, the gate of heaven. And he named that place Bethel, which means house of God. So Jesus is Jacob's ladder and gate of heaven. In this story, Jesus has been given nine names, Lamb of God, Rabbi, 
Messiah, the one we've been looking for, Jesus, son of Joseph, son of God, Jesus, uh, king of Israel, Jacob's ladder, heaven's gate, nine names. The names of Jesus are, in fact, endless because he is endless. We will be naming him forever because he is the mystery of God made flesh. But that's not all the story. Jesus was naming them, too, naming us. Perhaps God has given to us, each of us, our own secret name. A name that God has been trying to reveal to us all our lives. The name that captures who we are and what we are called to be and to do in this world. Maybe your secret name is Valiant or Beloved or immortal diamond. In the final book of the Bible, Revelation, Jesus says that at the end, we will be given a white stone on which is written a new name, a name that is a secret name that only we and God know. I love thinking about that. A name that God has been trying to reveal to us all our lives. Maybe even today, God is whispering to you your name. 